Hello. Well, I think um, I think we'll start. Um, welcome, um, everyone. Um, it's great to see uh, so many people here. Uh, we have a, a lot of people on on the call today. Uh, my name is um, Emily Walsh. I'm an associate. Uh, director at Sistra. Um, I sit within our movement and place team um, where we look at how we plan and design transport at all scales um, to deliver good places. So really interested in uh, the subject of our discussion this morning. Um, this is the fourth of six uh, webinars, so there are two more to go. Right at the end, we'll tell you about the next one. Uh, which Sistra uh, are, are delighted to, to host. And today we're going to look at uh, the benefits and the big challenges um, in integrating uh, land use and uh, transport. And this is in the lead up uh, to the publication of the guidance uh, for the next generation of LTPs, so it's, it's, it's very timely. And we have four fabulous uh, speakers today. We have Linda Addison, John Sanford, uh, Darren Kirkman, who's one of my colleagues, and Neve uh, Hessian. Um, they're going to speak for uh, around um, 10 minutes each, and then we'll have a couple of questions, very quick questions, and hopefully about 40 minutes um, at, the, um, at the end for, for a panel uh, discussion. Um, please, could you put your questions in the Q&A? So um, obviously, we will be picking up questions for the, from the Q&A to, to ask panel members. So please put all your questions in the Q&A and any sort of observations in the chat. We're really interested in what people think needs to change. Um, so, um, you know, if you have any things that particularly need to be changed within the PPF or other uh, national policy, uh, it would be great to, to see that in the chat. I think it'd be very, very interesting. Um, so without further ado, I am going to hand uh, over to uh, Linda Addison, who is going to introduce herself uh, and um, uh, talk about some of the challenges. Thank you very much, Linda. Uh, good morning, everybody, and lovely to speak to you all, even though I can't actually see you. Um, uh, I'm going to, I am the lead for the Transport Planning Society on the Integration of Planning and Transport currently. I'm also a CIHT technical champion on the same subject and a, a design council expert. So I really focus on the whole issue of planning and transport as I'm both a planner and a transport planner. So planning and transport, what we need to do in terms of integration. I believe given all our expertise across the, all the professions, we know what we need to do. The problem I think we've got is why is it not happening? Next. So I think, next, please. So I think we need to focus on a few things. From my experience, uh, one of the key essential things I think we need to do is change attitudes and behavior. And that is both the political attitudes to this whole subject area, but also the community, because without changing the community attitudes, we won't change the political attitudes. And I think the past, well, 20 or 30 years has demonstrated the problems that we've got in that particular field. But we also need to change policy and practice. And I'm going to come on to all of those issues in a minute. Next. So as we all know, uh, who are in this room, virtual room, travel is a de derived demand. It connects us to job services, friends, family. It's therefore linked very much to uh, the spatial planning process, developing local plans, neighborhood plans, where we grant planning permission. This fundamentally affects how we travel in the way we travel. The fact that that's so obvious, it does beg the question why it's not built into the planning, planning system as it stands, and it isn't in an effective way. So I think that's a fundamental core problem that we have. So, but we also need to recognize that actually how we are accessing services and opportunities continues to change as being demonstrated through COVID and before with new technology. So 
underpinning what we need to do, uh, apart from understanding that core issue and getting people to understand that core issue, particularly politicians and communities, is actually collaboration. Again, I'm going to pick that up in a minute. So next. So the key areas that we need to change, I think, in terms of policy is overall, all national policy needs to reinforce and be consistent with the whole issue of integrating planning and transport, whether we're talking about health or education, any of these issues. The integration of planning and transport needs to be fundamentally understood and, and incorporated. The national planning policy framework is clearly critical. It is likely to be reviewed, I think, in the not too distant future. So we need to make sure what changes take place are the right changes and drive us in the right direction. Um, so in order to do that, the integration of planning and transport at government level is fundamental and they need to work together, whether it's in the same department or collaboration across departments and link to the other departments that uh, will influence planning and transport. Underpinning the national planning policy framework is a whole series of methodologies. They need to fundamentally change in many ways and therefore lead to a change in policy and practice at the local level because the two are interlinked. Next. Moving on, then, if we're going to get those changes, uh, we need to make sure that the cabin office and number 10 actually understand the key issues that are required. And at the moment, I'm not convinced that's the case. And certainly we need to understand both the Secretary of State's Department for Transport and DLUC where they stand on this issue. And they need to be on board because without their agreement, we will not get the changes necessary. So the interrelationship with them, the senior civil servants in those key departments of DLUC and DFT are fundamental. And so that we are not fighting them, they are on board and driving change rather than in a sense how I feel we, in some instances we're fighting them. They will influence clearly local politicians uh, who are making a lot of the decisions that are critical. Um, and politicians, whether at national or local level, will respond to the drives coming from the local community, as clearly evident in things like local um, low traffic neighbourhoods and the problems that have been experienced about cycle routes or, or any of those sort of issues of reducing the access to cars. Next. So we've got to therefore work both bottom up and top down. And I think the bottom up is critical if we're going to get the top down to understand what needs to happen. Next. Really engaging the communities to change, to understand their attitudes and behaviour, to change how they believe, what they understand about these issues will be core, I think, to changing attitudes, changing policies. Because unless people understand what's going on, they won't change and they won't be able to influence politicians. Next. So one of the pieces of work that I've been involved in over the last few years is, is about our future towns, changing hearts and minds. And it's working with people to get them to help them to understand uh, what the issues are that we're facing as a global society as a local society, looking at what's happening in their local area, whether it's mileage, woodland required to deal with pollution, amount of pollution in their local communities. So it's very locally based. Um, and the idea is to hear and understand people and then help them to look at the problems that we're facing. Next. So Key people to influence at local level, if we talked about what we need to influence at national level, local level, I think fundamentally, we've obviously got to work with local communities, local leaders and local cabinets, uh, as well as dealing with parish and town councils, because the pressure will come from the bottom through those particular organisations and also local leaders who are driving, whether it's um, climate change uh, consortium or those sort of people, and also children and teachers. It's clear from all the evidence that young people are much more on board with this particular agenda than many older people. So we've got to uh, encompass that drive and help them to influence what's going on locally, and that will influence what goes on nationally. Next. 
So one of the things that we've been doing as a, a set of professional organizations, CIHT, RTPI and TPS, is we undertook a survey earlier in the year of all the professionals, all the membership. Um, looking at what the problems were, because one of the issues that we've been asked to address in meetings that we had with DFT is actually producing evidence of what the problems are. So we've been trying to do that through this survey, which will be published in mid-November with key recommendations. And the sort of issues that came up in that survey as the key problems is obviously key statements in the MPPF, a lack of really good examples about what delivering sustainable transport and sustainable places really means and how you do it, problems with the policy and methodologies, and also the fact that finance provision doesn't necessarily follow their old drives us in the wrong direction, rather than following what we, we're suggesting we need to do in terms of integrating planning and transport to drive sustainable development. Next. So what we need to do, in, in my view, uh, and how we need to get there is we need to change the MPPF fundamentally so it's driving the change that we want, that it's linked to the DP DFT decarbonisation policy and the new forthcoming local transport plans in a clear, explicit way, that the methodologies around carbon capture and accessibility become common methodologies across planning and transport. And the DFT is currently working on new methodologies around carbon capture measurement and also uh, accessibility measurements, which hopefully will feed into this process, as well as new transport appraisal systems. All of those things need to be reinforced through the decision making process, whether it's a national decision making process or the local decision making process. But underpinning all of that to get those changes, we need collaboration because planning, transport and all the other things we're talking about, the private sector, the public sector, have to work together if we're going to get the change that we need at the speed we require in the way to get the solutions that we're looking for. And that's authorities, professions, private transport sector, communities and developers and landowners. We all need to understand the agenda. We all need to work coherently together. Part of that problem will be ensuring that everybody has the skills and knowledge they need to be able to do that and work together in those ways on the right sort of issues that we're talking about. That's the our future town sort of work, working with communities. It's through professional training and CPD across all the professions, whether architecture, engineering, planning, transport. We all need to understand the agenda and what we need to do to drive the change fast. Next. So in conclusion, um, I have to say I have to work on the basis of hope. Something that Octavia Hill made very clear in a lot of her documentation that we, we wouldn't have achieved the changes that we do have achieved over the last hundreds of years without hope and that real desire to change. And I think we need to maintain that hope, but also ensure that we really do drive change this time because we haven't any time to lose. So we need to do it now. Thank you. I'll pass back to Emily. Uh, thanks very much, Linda. I've been told that um, my my um, mic is feeding back a bit, so um, hopefully I've moved it away. It should should be slightly slightly less uh, less feedback now. I did. I, I I told Linda I was going to ask her this, but I think um, <laughs> I think yeah, there's clearly an awful lot to do, and those of us that have been uh, around for um, a few years. Uh, uh, recognize the difficulties and but I think some things have been achieved you know in in the last sort of 10 to 15 um, years but I just wondered what Linda thought and and whether you know what positive steps have been made um, and, and what we can learn from those I, I do think there are a lot of positive steps that have been made um, the fact that the DFT has set up a new planning division is a major change forward the fact that they are doing all the work that I mentioned around methodologies uh, linked to carbon, linked to accessibility, linked yeah. to method, uh, the, the whole issue of moving away from predict and provide, whether it's decide and provide uh, or vision and validate. There are real changes going on. And I think the understanding uh, across communities is improving. We we are now talking about climate change nationally. We are understanding it in a better way. So I think we're the ground is much firmer for us to move forward. 
The fact that we're still building development in sites which aren't accessible by sustainable transport still demonstrates there's work to go. And the MPPF underpins that, unfortunately. So, but yeah, I think definitely we have made substantial progress, but it's a bit erratic. <laughs> it is yes, not. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Linda. Um, we'll go um, straight on to uh, John uh, Sanford now. And uh, John, would you like to introduce yourself? Um, and I'll drop off for a moment. Certainly. Um, well, good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm John Sanford from the a government agency Homes England and I work for a small team that in within the agency that is responsible for promoting design quality in our projects and with our, our partners. Uh, next slide. So I'd like to talk to you about vision-led provision for transport and place investment. So uh, Linda's mentioned the term vision and validate, decide and provide, manage and monitor in my view, they're kind of very much overlapping terms. And so this we try sort of this idea of vision-led provision could be something that, that brings all those together, perhaps. Um, but fundamentally, it, it's a new approach to how we appraise the impacts of transport and try and bring together transport and land use planning and digital together. Um, next slide, please. So what's, what's the intention behind this? Well, I guess fundamentally, it's about trying to deliver sustainable places, but also deliverable places. So very often we uh, are trying to deliver large sites in Homes England uh, um, and small sites, but large sites, and we get embroiled in big highway projects to enable them. Um, I think vision-led provision potentially is about trying to make places more deliverable, and more sustainable. Uh, key to that is making places self-contained and uh, promoting places where trips, particularly in the peak hours, are uh, very much more internalised. Making sites, therefore, viable and deliverable because we're not getting as bogged down, to use that phrase, in uh, large-scale housing projects to enable development. Um, to re-envisage how uh, people use transport in the context of development and to promote uh, a step change in, in behaviour, transport behaviour and transport choice, a move towards behavioural engineering rather than civil engineering to solve uh, problems, um, and to therefore to be able to reframe, rebalance and re-emphasise the investment in infrastructure associated with places. Um, the diagram there is quite an interesting model that's been produced by the Network for Business Sustainability that is about promoting social change. And my contention is that that could very well be applied to um, applying behaviour change for transport uh, for, for new places. Next slide, please. There's a lot of background then that's going on uh, that supports this approach. Um, interestingly, there was an appeal recently, Hartford appeal, where the inspector said it is not the purpose of the planning of planning policy to prioritise and protect the convenience of the car commuter. And I think that's a fundamental question that we need to focus on in a, taking a different approach. So uh, government uh, is evolving policy in this area. We have the DFT's uh, decarbonising decarbonizing transport document of 2021, which talks about vision and validate. Um, uh, departmental and agency practice is evolving towards these lines and the department is issuing guidance on a transport appraisal um, that is, is interesting uh, and changing the way we should think about things. Um, Oxfordshire County Council have produced a very interesting transport, local transport connectivity plan with an annex that is explicitly about so-called vision and validate. Um, the institutions, the RTPI, CIHT, and others are talking about this as a way of promoting um, a new approach. And in fact, this event is, is one of those uh, initiatives, I guess. Um, COVID-19, uh, if there is a silver lining to it, I think it was potentially about the way people work differently. And it's quite clear that people can work differently if they need to. There are certain vision and validate or vision led provision application cases that have come through, which have shown that things in development can work differently. And we're trying to promote and enable uh, this, these types of approaches. Next slide, please. 
what are the components then of vision-led provision? Well, there's a number of them. I'm not going to go into detail about all of them, but things like, um, first of all, it's fundamental to get the buy fundamental to get the buy into this approach. All the stakeholders around the table need to buy into the fact that uh, it's not going to be a predict and provide uh, process. It's going to be something that's led by the vision. That we look at scenarios uh, and we backcast from the end state that we want and plan the uh, transport provision leading towards it. Um, I think there's an issue of, of challenging um, the boundaries um, that we assume uh, behind uh, transport situations. Uh, this idea, the whole idea of ironing out congestion for cars, can we challenge that um, as a fundamental to make sure, as I say, places are internalized, but also can, we, can decision making be based on CO2 outcomes rather than travel time saving outcomes and let that drive and influence much more strongly the choices we make about investment, but also about uh, change management. How do we change the culture in which we approach development uh, appraisal and transport appraisal? Um, how do we sort of take a new approach to risk about congestion? Uh, and the so what questions? What if congestion happens? Could it not, in fact, be a good thing because people then make different choices? Let's get into revolution rather than evolution. Um, let's make let's try and make it so that we do appraise situations fundamentally differently towards achieving sustainable and integrated transport and planning solutions for sites. Next, next uh, uh, slide, please. I think the triple access planning model, which was produced by uh, Glenn Lyons and others at the University of the West of England, is a great model to use to understand this because it recognizes that there's an integration of transport interventions, spatial planning interventions, but also digital connectivity, digital access, as demonstrated, as I said before, by the COVID-19 experience and people working differently, facilitated by digital connectivity. Um, and this model can be used as a way of grouping ideas and interventions uh, around a situation uh, accepting that not all projects will have the same mix of solutions, but accepting that we do need to integrate and connect together both spatial planning uh, initiatives, the role of density, um, next to transport, etc. Transport interventions themselves, active travel networks, um, sustainable uh, travel um, interventions, mobility hubs, etc. And also the smart place planning and digital connectivity. Uh, Next slide, please. What are we doing in this space? Well, uh, Homes England are asking these questions. How do we approach, how do we apply this approach, uh, enabling uh, this approach to be taken and advoc advocating that we should be taking this through our uh, so-called end-to-end process, where we take projects through from their inception and the pipeline, where we understand that there is a, a site available, right the way through to delivery of those sites on the ground with house builders. We're asking the question, how can this approach be applied at each stage in that process? We're also engaging with the, this, the, the uh, built environment sector, to call it that, um, we're working with the RTPI, CIHT, uh, and with the DFT in, in promoting this approach, participating in this kind of event where we're raising awareness of it, but also in specific projects where we're uh, working with local authorities and our project partners to see if this sort of approach cannot be applied in practice. Next slide, please. One idea that we have is uh, to develop, um, I suppose, uh, something akin to the place standard tool, which was produced by the Scottish government uh, several years ago now, produces a graphical output as to how a site is performing against various uh, criteria. So the pro proposition here is, you know, could we have a checklist of um, vision led provision uh, interventions and indicators? to score them uh, along the way as a project evolves uh, and to have a running graphical output as to how well a project is performing against a vision-led provision outcome. So I'd be interested to know if anyone's, that idea resonates with anybody. 
um, because that is something that uh, might be useful. Next slide, please. So we've instituted an, uh, or implemented another, a number of case studies where we've tried to get this approach going. Um, and it's not only us, but other developers as well have done the same. Uh, I won't go through all of them in, in detail, but uh, for example, um, uh, we did some work along the uh, growth along the A1 corridor, and we commissioned a study that looked at various scenarios uh, with a view to planning transport and settlement types uh, in line with those different scenarios. Longmaston Garden, Garden Village is an interesting one there. Our consultants did a, a very comprehensive study of how vision and validate might be applied to Garden Village as a way of trying to um, mitigate the need for a 150 million pound uh, link road by making the site much more internalized and sustainable in the way it operates. Um, Pickering's Farm, we in Preston, there, there is a, a, um, an inquiry that it, the decision of, about which is, is awaited, but there we put forward a, a vision and validate approach to that development on the basis of a much more sustainably operating place. And various of the garden villages and towns are putting forward uh, vision and uh, vision led provision type uh, approaches. Um, a notable case actually is at Silverstone Park, where this approach led to the transformation of the interventions from, as I understand it, um, uh, a £25 million motorway junction towards a £5 million, instead of that, a £5 million sustainable transport package. And what that sort of situation does is it need, means that rather than that money going to uh, highways infrastructure, which in some cases is needed, there's no doubt about that, but it enables the reallocation of investment potentially towards places, the quality of the place, the quality of the environment that people will enjoy. So I think we're saying we're not necessarily about investing uh, less, it can be about investing differently to make better uh, places. We've also done some formative studies in terms of smart place investment, um, uh, smart place and smart city investment in sites. Next slide, please. Um, so how, what do we do then? Um, I think there's a, there's a case to say, let's adopt a structured project management approach to this, both in the context of particular sites, and there we have in front of us a, a project management model. So you could apply uh, vision-led provision thinking through that model as you develop the transport solutions for a site. Uh, but more strategically, is there a need for a national vision-led provision project that is about instituting change in the industry and the way that transport and planning uh, work together in, in delivering science. So that transport isn't just seen as being the tail on the dog, but rather it is the spine that uh, is fundamental to the way places work uh, and that it is fundamental in influencing the spatial layout and planning of sites. So that is my last slide. Back to you, Emily. Thank you uh, very much, John. That was really, really interesting. I mean, the thing that has, has really sort of grabbed me about what you've said is the vision-led approach. And it, it was very interesting that you picked up the places standard from, from Scotland, because that's, that's a, a, a really um, helpful tool. Um, uh, just um, one quick question before I do that, could I also uh, remind people to put their questions in the Q&A and not in the chat, please. We will be picking up questions from the Q&A, uh, not the chat box. So please put uh, questions in there. Um, just, just a very, very uh, quick one, really. I mean, you know, vision led. Um, if you could um, just quickly uh, talk about what should be included in that vision, and you know, is is it important that that's something that is held by the community as well? Just going back to uh, the point that Linda made about starting from the bottom up. 
Um, so maybe you could start responding to that and we can talk about that a bit more later. Thank you. Are you asking so what, me that question? Yes, yes. So what, what <laughs> should be included yeah, in the well, vision? I guess, you know, uh, it, my experience of dealing with sites over, you know, I've been with, with, with Homes England or its variant for sort of 12 years or so, you know, it's fundamental to get agreement around the table at the earliest point about what it is we're trying to achieve. Um, so I think the vision is really, in this case, about um, agreeing uh, an outcome for the site and it would be fundamentally people make sustainable transport choices, that the land use plans for sites will, you know, make the connection between um, development, density and the opportunity to use public transport and active travel. Um, that the whole vision for the place as it operates will be sustainable in the way it works, the way people live. So that's the sort of vision I think we're talking about for places. And it's about making sure there's no, there's no point having that vision if everybody doesn't buy into it, because things will then regress inevitably back to the a, a predict and provide approach. So I think that's one aspect. Um, but I think as well, it's about making sure that, as I say, the transport planner has an equal place around the table with the master planner and that the, the transport planner and the master planner, the urban designer work together um, in an integrated way towards that sort of sustainable uh, vision led outcome, vision led place. That's interesting. So it's about it's about the weight of involvement, I guess, is is, is one thing, isn't it? Um, OK, thank you so much, um, John. Really, really interesting. Um, I'd like to uh, now call on uh, Darren Kirkman. Um, are you Hi, everyone. My name is Darren Kirkman. I'm an associate director uh, for Sistra. Um, I work in the transport planning team where I um, work mainly on policy and, and strategy. So um, I've been asked to speak for 10 minutes on um, how transport planning and land use planning can work together to create genuinely sustainable communities. There you go. So what I'm going to cover is how, what we mean by sustainable communities, how transport can create them. And we're going to look at two specific land use strategies, namely transport oriented development and 15 minute cities. And then I'm going to cover some principles for creating sustainable transport networks uh, which support local communities. So just briefly, what do you mean by sustainable communities? Um, well, there are many definitions, but I think essentially we're talking about places that cater to the needs of residents now and into the future, that are environmentally sustainable and don't place a burden on natural resources, and that are well run, providing the needs for, for all residents. Um, and because these communities respond to local needs, they are by definition diverse, but I think they have a, a number of common features. They're inclusive, meaning that people have a sense of pride in belonging in the area. They're designed with a full range of the needs of residents in mind. They're physically well connected, both internally and to other places. They're attractive in terms of the quality of jobs, education and services available. And they're socially equitable, providing opportunities for all, both now and into the future. Um, transport can make or break a community. So poor transport, that's inadequate transport or the wrong type in the wrong place, waste people's time, can cause air pollution, accidents, severance and general misery. Whereas the right type of transport can enable people to move around quickly easily, conveniently, and without placing a burden on society. And I've given an example of, on the slide of how transport can reduce some of those externalities, which I won't read out, but you can see what they are. There. So in, in terms of spatial strategies that can support sustainable communities, I wanted to quickly highlight two. One is Transport Oriented Development, or TOD which is an urban planning strategy that focuses development on those areas which are by definition the least dependent on car, that's public transport interchanges. And Todd requires civic leaders to develop a vision for the urban form of their cities and the role of the transport system in supporting that vision. 
and it requires them to identify those areas most suited to being developed at a higher density. It also requires planners to put in place the policies needed to deliver that vision. So I'm talking about mixed use zoning, increasing densities in accessible locations, down zoning in non-accessible non locations, and lowering parking maximums to discourage driving and free up space for other uses. Uh, and an allied and complementary strategy is that of the 15 minute city. And here we're talking about creating a number of overlapping neighborhoods where the majority of people's needs in terms of access to services, schools, the doctors, local shops, et cetera, can be accessed by a, a short walk or bike ride with access to high quality public transport for longer journeys to say a city for, for access to work, for example. And you can see how the, the, the idea of these 15 minute neighborhoods has gained kind of increased salience given the increase in working from home as a result of COVID. Uh, so next I want to discuss three principles for delivering uh, more dense developments and viable transport networks. Uh, and the first of these is to maximise the travel market. And by that I mean maximise the number of people living within easy walking distance of public transport stations and stops. Um, I believe really strongly that we can't begin plan making or we shouldn't begin plan making by inviting developers to suggest sites for development. Plan makers need to establish a really clear spatial vision for an area and set criteria which developers need to meet if their sites are to be considered. And I think also the, you know, the threshold for refusing development on transport grounds needs to be lowered. Uh, presently, it can only be refused if it has a severe impact on the transport network, but severe isn't defined. This means it's, it's relatively easy in practice for developers to make the case that the impact from their site is less than severe. And I've seen a few comments in the, in the chat box referring to, this is paragraph 111 of the, of the MPPF. Uh, we also need to make it clear, uh, we also need to make it easier uh, to build on brownfield sites. That may mean financial assistance with land assembly or increasing permitted densities for development or changing zoning policies to encourage more mixed use so that areas are in use all day round and all week round. And finally, and this is a big one, uh, we need a cultural change to make living density attractive to people at all stages of life. We're a, a relatively small island with a population of almost 70 million and it's not sustainable for people to live at present den densities. Um, we aren't helped by the unsuccessful housing experiments of the past, but even in the, in the present, apartments are too often too low quality and too small to be attractive to, to people and families of all ages and all income levels. Uh, the second principle is for us to make public and active transport offer attractive for all types of potential user. Uh, this involves adopting a whole planning, or sorry, a whole network approach to planning integrating the physical planning of all modes so they intersect, integrating fares so people only have to pay once, and integrating operations so that a single body is responsible for all aspects of the network. Uh, it also means improving the experience of, of PT by providing high quality, high frequency services, um, optimizing routes to minimize overlap and developing a legible intuitive network. And giving the network um, an attractive identity, car companies spend billions on marketing and image management in order to create a, an aspirational and desirable brand. And we need to learn some of the lessons from that. We should be reallocating road space for, for PT and for active travel. Not only does that make it easier to, to run good services, it sends out an important cultural message about the relative importance of public transport and the private car. And we need to make it, uh, sorry, we need to be better at embracing technology so it's easier for people to plan, navigate, and, and pay for their journeys. And finally, because this can't all be about the carrot, we do need a few sticks. Uh, and this means adopting policies that dissuade car ownership and use, such as the removal of parking spaces, setting low maximum parking thresholds, and increasing the cost of parking. We also need to be designing the urban realm to reduce the number of cars and to make the, their journeys more circuitous and less competitive than other modes. That can be through signage or modal filters or other types of filtered permeability. 
and we need to better capture the, the full cost of travel through the introduction of a progressive form of road user charging or other measures such as you know, workplace parking levies, for example. Uh, so just a few concluding remarks. Um, we need to be thinking about transport from the outset of urban planning. It's not something that can be retrofitted once the urban form has been decided. Transport and planning should be complementary. You know, good, good land use planning reduces the need for car trips and good transport planning can make cycling, walking and PT uh, the natural and preferred choice. Uh, and finally, we spend a lot of time making the case for transport infrastructure to level up the economy, but we can also make the infrastructure we already have work harder by increasing the number of people that can easily access it, which generates uh, additional economic benefits as well as social and environmental ones. Uh, so that's everything from me. Thanks very much, uh, Darren. Lots of um, things to pick up there, but I think looking at the time, we'll move straight on to Neve. I hope you don't mind. And um, then uh, start picking up questions that, that people are, are, are raising uh, when uh, Neve's finished talking in a couple of minutes. So thank you very much, Darren. Uh, Neve, are you ready to um, come in? Yeah, let's go with my So good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Neve Hessian. I'm um, design director at Turley, and I've been working on projects big and small, mostly across the south of the UK. And I've been keen to place the 20 minute neighbourhoods at the front and centre of many of the master plans that I've been involved with. So when I started thinking about pulling together this presentation, I started to draw on the usual suspects in terms of references for mass planning and urban design. There's so much we can talk about. 20 minute neighbourhoods, compact urban areas, sustainable se settlement guide. These are things that we've been talking about for more than a generation. But what kept on springing into mind was a cartoon I remember from years ago called What on Earth? This is an animated mockumentary that imagined if aliens from Mars observed the Earth, that they would think cars were the primary life form. That was an animation that was created in the 1960s. And I believe it's um, arguably even more valid today. So I'm not as a designer, I'm not usually one for statistics. However, when I was checking the figures for this presentation, some figures popped out. So as somebody mentioned earlier, there are around 67 million people living in the UK. 53 million people over the age of 18. There are 41 million registered vehicles in the UK. And if you round it up, that's almost one vehicle per person. If you take that even further and you assume that each of those vehicles takes up one car parking space, that equals to around about over 500 square kilometers, which is five times the area of Bristol purely to host vehicles. As a result, our streets are vessels for vehicles. How do we make places for them? How do we make them places for people? So as master planners, what are we doing to encourage behavioral, behavioral change? Are we designing buildings simply around parking spaces? Or are we, are we designing places that happen to allow cars in? Are we adapting cities to accommodate more traffic? Or are we designing cities and, space and places that provide a realistic option for people not to just, just leave their cars at home, but to ultimately give them up? And are we thinking outside of the box, cre thinking creatively about how we use and design our existing streets and spaces? So here's a street, a Victorian street you might find in many cities across the UK. What happens so imagine yourself on the street. What happens when you remove all the cars? Do you notice the destination at the end of the road? Or do you notice the bins um, hogging up the, the pavements? So you accommodate the bins. You might plant some trees. You could place some seats out and people may start to use it as a, as a place, not a car park. I use this street as a metaphor. 
Scaled up or scaled down, the principle is simple. If you design, create attractive routes for walking, cycling, running, attractive public transport routes and modes, people will use them. So what are my thoughts? Prioritize investment and uh, policy in the enhancement of public realm and enable people to make step changes to reduce their own ownership of private vehicles and reward them when, when they do. Enable people to take ownership of their streets and normalize this behavior, make it an aspiration. So thank you very much for listening to me this morning and I'll hand back to Emily. Do the panel want to come back on uh, line? Neve, thank you so much for that. That was that was um, really interesting. And I think, you know, um, delivering uh, good streets at that level is obviously so dependent on, you know, the, that, that wider um, level of um, strategic planning in terms of, you know, what people can what people can access. Um, have I have I got all my panel back? I don't think I can see all of you, but um, there we go. I can I can now. We we have um, so firstly thank you um, thank you very much um, uh, for for those um, for those um, uh, presentations. Um, we have a, a lot of um, questions um, in uh, the Q and A, and and I'll pick up some specific ones, but also some sort of general. Uh, themes, I think, and I think just just starting at the the very sort of strategic scale in terms of the structure of our decision making bodies and our planning bodies. Um, and there have been a couple of questions about, you know, is it two tier or three tier that that you know it integrates uh, transport and land use best? But I mean, do you think there are any current big structural problems in the way that we make decisions and we plan you know we often have highway authorities separate to planning authorities um, um i just wondered if there are any observations you know we don't have a national transport body um unlike i think ireland does have a, tra a national transport body so i mean you know i mean are there those are there some big structural issues there linda you've <laughs> you I, I thought you might say that emily um <laughs> Yes, there are structural problems, but if we actually decide we can't do anything without sorting out the structural problems, I think we could be here in another 40 years. Yes. Uh, having been involved in a government reorganisation, local government reorganisation on a number of occasions, uh, I, I think we, there isn't a perfect system that works for planning and transport across the country, Every, you know, because we've got a lot of different sorts of places. I think what at the core what you need to do is work with the organization that we have however that works and actually collaborate so you set up bodies and let me john pick this up as well you can set up a body as i did when i was in west london as i've done when i was in norfolk you you set up a body that's collaborative with all the right people around the table and you work together whatever the structural organization is and you do that both at officer level and you hope you can do it also at political level, at member level. So I think, yes, that it is an impediment, but with the right approach, the right understanding by all parties, then you can overcome them. John, do you want to come in on that as well? You... Well, yeah, certainly. Um, in my experience, you know, when you're trying to make plan a site or make a change it's fundamental to get alignment between the key stakeholders isn't it um in terms of um a structural ch issues uh, in planning i mean i think there's a there is a structural or could, could call it that a structural question which is about the as i referred to the ironing out of, con of congestion so it seems to me there is an underlying presumption in transport planning that any form of, uh, or, you know, any material degree of uh, tra car congestion must be ironed out by mitigation. And it, the, the fund of that, in my view, that locks us into this perpetual predict and provide cycle. And so I think there's a need to sort of challenge that really and say, okay, so if congestion occurs, actually it, it could be a positive thing because it induces yeah. people to make different choices. Um, now, 
we all there's no doubt that when development happens which is what i'm fundamentally concerned with you know you do have to have transport and highways investment to enable those places to be accessed you can't get away from that um but and similarly there are can be significant safety issues so we often come across the age-old issue quite rightly about uh, protecting the safety of slip roads from the motorway network so there are you know some fundamentals but by the same token, I think there's a need to sort of say to local authorities, can, you know, can we take a risk that, yes, congestion might arise, but instead of building a, a bypass or a big link road to enable this development, we'll actually invest in, you know, uh, pioneering state-of-the-art active and sustainable transport networks. Um, etc. So that, that fundamental question, I think, is a, is a structural one and the degree to which we can challenge that as well, as I, I alluded to in my presentation, how what good looks like, you know, yeah. should solutions be about trying to minimise travel time savings brackets for cars, or actually should what good looks like be driven by the uh, CO2 outcomes? Uh, and certainly in the context of climate change emergencies that lots of local authorities have declared, one would think that there is a moral onus on um, planning managers, et cetera, to consider new types of solutions. Emily, can I just come back on that? Because uh, not back can. in a sense negative, but, but John is rightly picking out all of those things. I think it's important for people to be aware that that work in terms of carbon and moving in the way that John's talked about is actually, I think, underway. Now, getting that through the system, getting it approved at political level and across the different government departments could be an issue. But actually, I think there is a move in that direction to move away from congestion, to move away from those issues and into carbon and into accessibility. It's a question we've got to get it to happen and get it to happen fast and be linked to the planning system, I think, as John said. That's um, really, really interesting. I don't, I don't know if anyone else wants wants to come back on on that. Um, I think we've probably um, we've probably um, covered uh, a lot of ground in that. I guess um, a sort of supplementary um, question. Again, just just picking up on some themes from um, the, the the questions in the Q and A. I mean, you know, is our is the way we identify development sites fit for purpose? You know, we have a we have a, a call for sites model, and um, there are examples. Um, uh, I mean, the two that I can think of, they're probably imperfect, but I think Copenhagen had a set out this this vision uh, a lot of years ago now of these these fingers of development along public transport lines. Um, I think um, there was a Wolfson Prize uh, winner looking at walkable neighbourhoods called Uxeter. So the point was they were they were plans looking around, you know, what was sustainable from a transport point of view rather than a call. It was it was a vision led approach. So do you think our call for sites model is um, is is uh, fit for purpose? That was my question. No. Right. <laughs> It's not, what would you do, no, Linda? <laughs> Sorry. I, I waffled on, but you've got straight to the point. I, I mean, think it's one of the fundamental problems with the okay. system, planning yeah. system at the moment, which has to change because loc location obviously drives all the travel demand. Yes, so absolutely. We're putting things in the wrong place, as the uh, Transport for New Homes has made very clear in its research. Um, one of the things that we've done as far as CIHT, TPS, um, together with RTPI, is put to the government and that that particular thing has to change as part of the changing methodologies as part of any new MPPF. Um, and what I hope that the new accessibility index, if that comes out, when it comes out, hopefully next year, that's being worked on at the moment, with Connected Places Catapult and DFT, if that's integrated as a driver, then the local authority does its vision, as John said, they have a vision for the place, worked with, with the local community, working together with the local community, devise a vision, look at accessibility as uh, in terms of access to services and transport as part of that determination of where space should go. And I think the local authority has to determine the location of development, not the development industry or the landowner. And I think then we can move towards sustainable development. But if it's all in the landowners, 
it's yeah. driven by money. It's not driven by the right decisions. And is that vision led as well? I mean, that's, that's vision about, led. That's vision it's, led. It's about a vision. Yeah. It's yes. vision led, as as John said. It has to be vision led. Vision led by the local authority in with in conjunction with the community, and then you identify where development should go. And also, I think as somebody put in some of the comments, it's not just about new development, it's about the place as it stands at the moment. It's how we can make the entire place or places more sustainable over time, not just about new development. So it's both. Uh, what, what I was going God, to God. say, sorry, what I was going to say as well is that, you know, at the moment we have a system that, uh, yes, the local authority tries to influence where development arises through the local plan process and the site allocation process. But the pragmatic and the practical reality is that often land comes forward because develop, uh, land owners decide they want to release the land and that land isn't necessarily in, in the optimal location. Yeah. Um, or land is, you know, Homes England deal with sites that, uh, you know, surplus government uh, land, uh, for example, MOD bases, et cetera, which are former airfields in the middle of uh, uh, nowhere, should we say, or not ideally located. And, you know, we have to try and make those places work in a sustainable way. Um, I suppose the, a char charting a, a way through that is by... Um, maybe strengthening the powers of acquisition of land so that where local authorities do identify site aid available that will make those sites then acquirable by buying through the public sector i mean to some extent that happens through um homes england at the moment but you know could that power that process be strengthened i suppose is an interesting uh, point um, re really interesting. Um, I, I wonder if we'll, um, there's a couple of um, questions about 20 minute, 15 minute neighbourhoods. Uh, um, it's something that's um, uh, being talked about um, a, a lot. And um, there are some specific challenges um, being asked about in, in relation to that. Um, and um, the, the specific issue that's been raised is how can we deliver 15, 20 minute neighbourhoods? Interesting that there are two timescales being, being talked about. And I wonder how well we understand what we mean by those things anyway. But one of the things that they're asking is how can they been del be delivered when, uh, for example, the NHS is, is consolidating services in, 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 in large centres? So, um, you know, what are the challenges? This this seems like a good idea. What are the challenges of delivering them? Are they realistic? Um, have have uh, the panelists got any uh, comment on that? Hi. Yes, of um, course. Lovely. Have, um, we've actually looked at this in um, in a in a couple of instances and wondered about the implementation of flexible places. So a community okay. centre situated at the heart of a new scheme. Um, because we all know that the high street has challenges and you know, the realistic reality and the viability of, of creating a new high street is challenging. But if you start by introducing a building that can be utilised for many, many different things, um, like uh, people you know, communally working or um a nursery a cafe that kind of thing but that that could also have um you know a temporary ser service for gp local nurse um and even an mp so so that you have these kind of little workshops that happen every 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 couple of weeks so you know you identify um a surgery on tuesday every other every other week and people can in the community can sign up to that and go go and utilize that community use. But the point is that it's not solely for that use. It can be used for many other different things as well. And a yeah. big, then it can have a, a step change in terms of how people utilize that, that local center. And the, the other thing I wanted to kind of pick up on as well is that the 20 minute neighborhood is as far as I understand it, is mostly about the, you know, the perception of how far somebody is going to be able to walk yeah. um, to, to various different facilities. 
And it, it's really important to implement that in our cities, but it's also important to understand how that could be utilized in um, more rural communities and in identifying the potential for regeneration of brownfield sites in rural areas, looking at the context of villages in that surrounding and understanding what's missing in those communities and are there things that you can introduce to a new scheme that could come to that could fulfill or um place into that wider community uh, a more cohesive and better working 20-minute neighborhood so you say you have four uh, satellite villages one of which is going to be new how do you how do you make that work and what are the facilities that you need to put in there? But the idea of using a network of existing community to make, make a more sustainable community overall. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that arises, uh, I guess, from that, and again, has um, sort of come, come up in the questions is, you know, whether we're clear about what what is needed to make a 20-minute a, a neighbourhood. And, and I wonder whether any um, there is any guidance that people can refer to here or, or elsewhere in the world, um, or Linda, whether you're aware of any uh, guidance being produced. Will the accessibility index, for example, uh, help us um, I identify um, what's needed in a in a um, twenty minute neighbourhood? So, you know, how how do we how do we nail down what that is um, so that we can test development? I guess as well. Um, from what I've seen so far, uh, Emily, I'm not sure that the uh, accessibility index as it's being developed at the moment will help specifically with the 15 stroke 20 minute neighborhood. Um, what it's designed to do, I think, is in a sense, take the place update PTALs um, okay. but be much more um, extensive and rigorous. It's not just about public transport. It's about access to services. So it's a much wider um, index than the PTALs is. And it's it's much more uh, developed in terms of looking at accessibility in the round is the idea. Um, and it would be used very much, I think, around both looking for sites, but also looking at uh, applications coming in to assess whether in fact you know, they meet the index. You could put it into your local plans, your local transport plans. But it's embryonic at the moment. It's in development. But I, I don't see it. But it might actually help at that level. But I'm not aware that that's the case at the moment. Emily, can I just come in just of course, briefly? Yes. Just, this issue of you know, planning for, for 15 minute neighbourhoods, 15 to 20 minute cities, whatever. Uh, I think all of these things require kind of long term planning and they, they, they require you know, a great deal of community buying and, and cross party buying because development is never short, you know, short term, it, it takes time. And I think a lot of what we've been talking about today and looking at the comments in the, in the chat is that devolution is really key to a lot of this because devolution by bringing those services and bringing these powers closer to to the people allows you to break down some of those silos. So speaking in Greater Manchester, where we have devolution of, of the NHS, for example, if you've got a long-term strategy, which is bought in by you know, the wide range of the community, all, all parties, it allows, and you've got, the, you've got the ability to pull those levers, it allows you to better plan services in the future. Because of course, 15 neighbor neighbourhoods are they're progressive, you know, they, they, they develop over time. You're not going to have a place which overnight will become one. So this is about having the powers and having the vision to make changes over time so that progressively areas become more sustainable by doing things like moving schools and doctors and health services into areas to reduce the, the need to drive. Thanks very much, Darren. That's, that's really interesting. Um, just uh, to um, uh, move us on and move on to, to some other questions that have been raised. Um, a couple of people, John, in your presentation, you referred to behavioural engineering. Mm. And um, a couple of people have picked that up and said, what, what does that mean? And I just wondered if you could 
uh, talk about that in a bit more detail and 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 then if if other panel members were, want to come in on that point that would be lovely as well so yeah well i mean i read uh, a while back now i mentioned this report by the network for business sustainability that puts forward a model for uh, affecting social change and I, I looked at this model and thought, well, that's really quite interesting. Um, and it could equally well be applied to how you seek to influence behaviour change and transport choices and transport behaviour change in a place or in a locality. Um, now, compare that to the current travel plan process in development. Often, in my experience, travel plans are, you know, very nice to have motherhood and apple pie statements about we'd like to have this and we might have this and we could have that and etc and we might fund this if we've got some money left over um whereas i think we need to take the travel plan process to the next level of sophistication where we really do try to seek to influence how get inside the heads of people what makes them make choices what influences their lifestyles get behavioral scientists involved um you know as i say make it much more sophisticated using that maybe the network for business sustainability's um model as a framework for hanging ideas and initiatives off um so that that's really what i was getting at behavioral engineering complementing to instead of civil engineering as we move forward. Emily, can I come add to what John's just said? Please um, do. I referred to in my presentation work that's ongoing um, with the Royal College of Art called Our Future Towns, uh, which was work initiated with Transport Planning Society, CIHT, RTPI and, and others, um, looking at the sort of thing that John's talking about. But not using the word engineering. It was about attitudes and behaviours and about helping people because you're helping them with information and understanding um, to, in a sense, change attitudes and behaviours through understanding and improved knowledge uh, by working with them. So it's doing it in an engaging process. It's the, the work that's been done in terms of the toolbox with the Royal College of Art looks at de different methodologies of engaging people, because people engage with information in different ways, whether it's games, videos, um, or uh, information presented in a different way. There's lots of different tools that are being developed to actually help the communities change their attitudes and behaviors in a way that, in a sense, delivers what John's talking about, which is that sort of behavioral change as opposed to engineering change. I mean, I noticed that somebody's just put a question in the questions about, you know, the advertising that is out there to all makers buy a, or induce us to buy a car. And yeah, you know, in many ways, cars are a good thing, aren't they? Um, I would imagine most of us around the table have got a car, access to a car, and they're great things to own and fun things to drive around. So you know you can't dispute that but whether or whether or not there's a case to say well actually how do we price parking for example on in new developments you know uh, could that influence the number of cars that people have or in fact their predisposition to own a car um, can there be much more sophisticated ways of people sharing cars in the context of development um, you know, we've got car clubs and so on springing up. That could be much more prevalent, one would think. Um, ideas about sort of fractional ownership of cars. Uh, all these things uh, could be in the mix so that they're not necessarily, uh, we're not saying cars are inherently evil. It's about saying, how can we encourage people to uh, travel and make choices in a more intelligent way? Um, I mean, that's that's the, the issue about parking is, again, something that's that's in the questions and, and how we, you know, if we're building a development, which is relatively low density with two car parking spaces, it's, it's, it's challenging, isn't it? Because you walk out your front door and there's there's your car. 
And just picking up on what you were saying, John, and I think there's also been a question about density. You know, there are other sort of model forms of development which are a bit higher density where, where parking is consolidated somewhere and maybe there's a, a car share as well. Do you think, you know, we really, and um, we're not really delivering those, those styles mm. of development in the UK. Is there a real need to change the, the design of development, the way that we're developing, the way that we're building housing? Um, I think, well, I think that's a very good question. Um, and potentially, yeah, you know, the, the, historically, at least, a, a house would be developed with, you know, one or two car park spaces within the plot. And, you know, so that creates an inherent, that create, potentially creates a demand for car use. Um, whether that could be changed, as you say, by centralising parking and saying to homeowners, look, yes, you can have a car park space, but it's going to cost you this amount of money or you can you can have to rent it every year or whatever. Um, I think that, that that sort of model is, is an interesting one that needs to be considered. I mean, there's quite an interesting case in Leeds, uh, a developer called Situ, Situ have done a site on the edge of Leeds city centre and they have put car parking in a structure with the housing on top. Admittedly, it was facilitated by the topography of the site that was quite challenging, but nonetheless, this idea of centralizing parking and people have the option to buy or rent a car park space, but it's not necessarily just provided with the house. Uh, those sorts of models are quite interesting ones that might be developed further in the future, perhaps. Sorry, I've, I've muted because I have a dog barking in the background, so I do apologise. Um, I, I don't know if anyone else wants to come on in that. I don't know, Neve, whether you've got any experience of other, you know, other other sort of ways of structuring development. Um, it's a, it's always a tricky one, um, and I, you know, I, I mentioned it in my presentation. You, know, you want to enable people to make um, sustainable transport choices so you the argument is therefore provide them with a car parking space but I think that there needs to be some um, effort on our side to reduce our, our car ownership um, and car clubs have been around for a really long time with kind of ebbs and flows of popularity I know that they're they're coming back up again now um, but the you know, the, the cost of actually utilizing car clubs is not incomparable to owning your own car. So I think that think that there does have to be some um, some kickstart to the cultural change because um, we, we kind of need to sign up to it. Um, parking is always an issue in terms of delivering density. Um, and unless you're delivering a high density city center, well-connected, um, you know, PRS development, you're gonna need to provide parking spaces under the context of, of delivering development uh, for de developers now. But I also think um, there are lessons to be learned from our experiences over the last couple of years in terms of COVID and our understanding of how neighborhoods work and it's certainly something that we're bringing into the, the design of um, new ma large scale master plans in terms of understanding exactly what people need day on day. And quite a lot of that is about providing a place to meet because we don't go to work anymore or we don't go to work as much as we used to. So a place to meet other people to work in the context of other people to go for a walk and that, that kind of thing. Um, but I do think that there has to be something that it needs to be top down as well as bottom up. We, we need to be encouraged to make those decisions. Presumably, just, though, uh, sorry, John, you come in. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, you know, building on what uh, Neve's just said um, and going back to the 20 minute neighbourhood or settlement concept, I guess part of it is... Um, asking for, if you're on the local authority, or if one is a client uh, trying to um, 
promote different types of new types of infrastructure to make the 20 minute settlements um, uh, happen. So, you know, work hubs, as Neve said, people like to work at home, but also sometimes they like to get out of the house and work in a, a, a you know, a cafe, whatever it is, just, but they don't necessarily want to have to commute long distance to the office. So uh, enabling that local living and working thing. Um, but I think also um, it's not just about walking, it can be about using micro transit, the emerging um, transit uh, options that are out there, scooters, um, electric scooters, electric bikes, etc. Having networks across the site that enable that sort of travel effectively. Um, so it's asking for a different sort of sets of infrastructure, I think, as well. Emily, can I just add to what Neva and, yes. and John have said? Um, yes. There has been the sort of thing that we're talking about in terms of the way car parking is treated in development um, in existence um, on the continent in Europe for years. I mean, a long, 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 long time where the car parking is separated from uh, a common, you know, the, the residential functions and put separately or in other ways made less accessible but still accessible you pay differently for it um it's not on your doorstep and i think that has already happened in in some developments uh in uh the uk but it's not pushed very hard and perhaps it needs pushing harder and i think there was work done by como who looked at this whole issue not only in terms of the sort of things that neva and john were talking about in terms of workspaces communal workspaces and where I live, they've got two of them going now, which have all happened during COVID. Um, but it's also um, where you can put, up, put uh, mobility facilities together, whether it's your electric bike or your scooter or your cycle uh, or, or get onto public transport or bus. It's about mobility hubs. So I think there's lots that are is already around. We know it exists. It's happening in some places. I think what the task is, is to make it much more common and happening basically all the time in most developments. So we're moving in the direction much faster than we want to go in terms of people having a choice not to use a car, not saying cars aren't necessary in certain times, they are, but actually having a choice to live without a car if you want, or only using a car from time to time. But making sure it's, as, as Neve said, it's, it's cheaper to do that than actually own a car with all the costs incurred. I mean, it, it, it was just interesting um, that 20, I'll, I'll just say one thing, um, It was, and then I'll come on to you, John. It's just interesting that as transport planners, we always talk about transport things as being the things that are needed for, you know, 20 minute neighbourhoods and sustainable transport. And I, I was just wondering about, I mean, the corner shop for me, the local shop for me is, is one of the um, most important things to have in a, in a 20 minute neighborhood and maybe we should be seeing that as, as as something that we need to you know we need to we need to support and deliver from a transport point of view um, I've seen thumbs up so maybe we don't need to discuss that any further <laughs> but John uh, you wanted to come in well yeah I've just seen um, one of the attendees expressing disappointment about the lack of um, uh, concern for public transport. I was just going to come on to that actually. Uh, yes, so you know, please I think go it's away. A fair question. I don't think any of us around the table are, are not interested or um, enthusiastic about public transport. I think um, what we're saying is that undoubtedly, I think public transport is undergoing maybe structural change because if people are working at home, you know, more. The, under, the background demand for public transport every day is reducing. So it seems to me public transport might be more moving more towards a demand responsive model, um, mobility as, as a service and all those things need to, need to come forward and develop in their level of uh, applicability and sophistication. Um, mobility hubs bring together those sorts of ideas on sites as well. Um, so yeah, a good point made about public transport, um, the quality of bus services, bus routes, bus stop infrastructure on sites, I think is very important, making sure people have got real time information um, uh, and, and that those facilities are smart in the way they operate. 
I, I think there's a couple of things to add to that, Emily. Yeah. One is I think local plans need to build in tr- public transport as part of the allocation of sites and the way the, the, the part of the vision so that people do have access to public transport. And that needs to be a fundamental um, part of any local plan uh, so that people can access not only getting perhaps by walking or cycling scooters, whatever, into their local centre, but can get work further afield if they need it or if they can't use bikes, they can get on a bus or some other form of transport. So I think it's fundamental to the plan that you have a long term strategy for public transport, as well as cycling and walking and other um, mobility aspects. Um, and that is, is where I think the local transport plan and the local plan needs to be cohesive, using the same evidence base uh, and having the same vision about how you relate new development and existing development to a public transport system, which should improve over the life of the plan. So it shouldn't be static. It should be a part of what we're trying to do, which is develop. And speaking as both a planner and a transport planner, I think I always think maybe I don't say it, but I always think you have to think about the two in concert all the time, not just about transport planning, but about how you make sure that actually happens through the planning process simultaneously in a collaborative way. I mean, I've got a question about um, that, uh, Linda, in terms of, um, but, but others, if they want to come in. I mean, often what you see is that the um, revenue support is sought uh, for uh, setting up bus services early on, which is uh, often very significant sums of money to, to get anything approaching a, a decent frequency. Um, I just wondered what you thought about the long-term viability of, of, of revenue support uh, to service a uh, new development because because it often seems that those bus services are not then sustainable and and fall away when uh, when the revenue support um, stops. I wonder if you've got an example of successful uh, bus services uh, you know established through development because uh, I think this is such a challenging area. Mm. I think you're right is extremely challenging um and i don't think there's any s- simple solution given certainly the impact on public transport of covid and the way uh as john said that you know p- work patterns are changing life patterns are changing um certainly work that i've been doing with network rail would suggest that the focus is not on commuting now it's on leisure journeys in however you describe leisure journeys which is in a sense becoming in balance with commuting journeys and people's commuting patterns are very different anyway because they're working at different sort of hours they're not the sort of nine to five type thing so the whole way that transport works is going to be fundamentally different i think in the future in terms of public transport but the revenue point i think is absolutely critical and i don't think there's a straightforward answer i mean one of the things that if one can collaborate with the public transport operators through both the local transport plan and through the local plan to make sure that there is cohesion between development and transport systems. And there is a a way of ensuring that the transport systems, the sustainable transport systems, public transport are more attractive than using your car. Back to the comments about, you know, not building out congestion. We should accept congestion. That's reality, it's gonna happen. We shouldn't be trying to build away from it, um, apart from in certain circumstances, so that we actually get people encouraged to use alternative modes of transport, which will reinforce the revenue. So I think it's a long term strategy that needs to develop, be developed as to how we can ensure the success of the future of public transport, given the revenue problems that it's, it's facing now, let alone it's going to face in the future. But it is it's not a simple solution. I don't see there's a clear answer at the moment at all i mean you you touched on there needing to be a strategy i mean it feels like um this is one of the fundamental areas the integration of land use and transport is totally critical because you need to plan bus services over a you know over an urban area and looking at Mm. you know where could be served uh, by high frequency public transport uh, and therefore um you know based on current patterns uh, feels like Um, something that maybe isn't happening effectively at the moment. We tend to look at new sites a bit in isolation from a public transport point of view. I mean, is that an area, a real area we need to work on? I don't know, John, whether you've got any observations to make or uh, Neve or Darren about um, uh, the the role of new development and master planning in that, how that can help. 
Um, well, uh, certainly when we are planning sites at Homes England, we will ask the question, um, you know, is this site going to benefit from a bus route going, and bus services going through it? And we'd also ask, ask the question about um, the quality of bus stop infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, it's difficult, isn't it, to um, control demand and, and therefore to control the, the business case for buses and bus services, other than through initial section 106 agreements that might commit the developer to a sum of money to fund bus services in the first instance. I think one of the key things will be that, uh, that, that we, we should be asking developers to do is to kickstart the bus service from day one of a development um, so that we try to embed and create the right behaviours from the start. There is work that, um, I don't know whether this helps uh, people, there is work that was done by CIHT uh, looking at how to plan for buses, which I think would be useful, like how to plan for cycling and walking, CIHT publications. Um, because I think actually building it into the planning process and building it into the local transport plan is fundamental, working collaboratively with the operators. Um, but also, I think we've got to, in a sense, encourage people to use it uh, and try and make it easy for them to do that. So, um, yeah, I'm sure I, 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 that Darren and, and Liam want to say something. I think, I think unfortunately, we're just, we're just about to... Um, to uh, run out of time. Uh, we've got about three more minutes. I don't know if uh, Darren or Neve have got any final observations on um, the, the challenges of, of delivering uh, public transport particularly. Just to say that Darren, on that last point there, I, I do think a, a lot of this comes down to the powers of, of local authorities, that you know, they, are, they are not sufficient and they are, and they are siloed. And I think greater levels of devolution uh, in, in terms of you know revenue raising as well as kind of planning powers is, is key. It does seem to be that the business model of for public transport that we have in this country, uh, you know, with you know with the reliance on the, the private sector kind of defining and providing it doesn't work. Uh, I think some of the, the steps towards the bus franchising in in certain areas and the, the kind of um, the experiment that we started with. With rail devolution, I think was, you know that was something which was stopped too early. I think, if anything, the kind of city deals in metro mayors and um, mayoral capital authorities is the, the greatest kind of opportunity we have to properly integrate land use planning and transport and all, and all aspects of public transport. But it does need the revenue; it does need the funding to back it up. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, um, Darren. I think that's a, a really good uh, point to. Um, point to finish on actually um, and um, I would just um, I would just like to um, thank the panelists it's been a really really interesting discussion I've, I've learned uh, loads today lots of uh, lots of um, food uh, for thought um, uh, I'd like to thank the audience for for joining us and raising some really really interesting questions and and lots of um, fascinating observations as well. There's a lot of really interesting uh, commentary um, in the chat. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank Sistra for um, hosting this and for um, uh, hosting uh, this um, these uh, six webinars. And uh, the final thing that I'm going to do in my last 30 seconds is to plug the next, uh, the next um, webinar, uh, which is, and I can't actually see it on my screen at the moment, but it's Future Mobility and Transport uh, Technologies on Tuesday, the 22nd of, of November at 10.30. So please do uh, join us, uh, join us for, for that. I'm sure that'll be a fascinating uh, discussion as well. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Have a good rest of the day.